This episode of the Get Fast Podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. You are joined as always by your host, former Australian Ironman champion, Jared Donnelly, and I am Jordan Donnelly. On today's episode, we are joined by Natalie Van Covorden, a current Australian tr- professional triathlete, one of Australia's top triathletes in the world at the moment. Natalie was born in New South Wales, Australia, comes from a swinging background and has now competed at seven world championships from, for, for Australia from the junior to elite level. She trains and competes both domestically and internationally, mostly on the WTS, the World Triathlon Series circuit, where she has finished as high as 11th in the world rankings. She got her first World Cup podium in 2013 and her first WTS podium in the 2018 season, where she was third place at WTS Abu Dhabi. She was also part of the Mixed Relay World Championships team that placed second in Hamburg and first in the Edmonton WTS Series Relay in 2018. Her most recent goals have been to qualify for Tokyo Olympics, which, as you'll find out in the episode, it was interesting to hear how that goal played out in 2020 and her plans for Tokyo 2021. Uh, She's currently joining us from Croatia uh, in Europe, uh, which made for a, a decent interview in terms of connection. We had a, a couple of interruptions, but most of the interview uh, should be fine audio-wise to hear. But we had a great chat to her about her pro- professional career so far. And uh, we got some great insights into uh, her professionalism and things that really make uh, her the athlete that she is today. So, and Dad, what did you take from this? Yeah, it was a fantastic interview and uh, we had a couple of little glitches because we're talking to someone who's in Croatia, but um, but uh, what she had to say, it was really reinforcing to our everyday uh, triathletes who are, who are, you know, trying to do their best and she's leaving no stone unturned. Her preparation, her planning um, is, is exemplary and it was a really good example of uh, how you go about um, you know, covering all bases with nutrition, with psychology, with um, with strength and conditioning, um, with recovery, with rest, with with sleep. It was it was the full the full uh, total package that um, that it really impressed me. And I'm so excited to see how she goes next year with the Olympics, and and hopefully she gets selected. And um, uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be someone who's, who really deserves it and not that anybody else doesn't. But, uh, yeah, it was an impressive, uh, really uh, uh, really powerful young female triathlete from Australia who's really doing well in, in the world stage. So, without further ado, here is professional triathlete Natalie Van Covorden. Okay, Natalie, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Welcome, and we're very glad to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we'll get straight into it. As a uh, professional athlete, how has 2020 been for you? It's been a wild year for everyone. How's it been for you? Um, I think actually think I've been a bit different to a lot of people. Um, I had the opportunity to come to Europe uh, in July. So I've done some IT races this year um, and rejoined uh, the circuit. Uh, a few good ones and a few bad ones. Uh, I think that's quite normal. Um, and everyone's sort of seasoned. Um, and I also joined a new coach this year. So uh, it was a really good chance for me to learn um, with him um, and experience how we can develop uh, leading into the new uh, Olympic year. Uh, yeah, I raced the world championship uh, that was in Hamburg, uh, which was a really good opportunity for me um, in a really stacked field for 2020. Um, and yeah, I raced all the way to um, November. And I think maybe I would have been one of the only people that actually raced uh, pretty much every single uh, race that was available in Europe. Fantastic. And uh, the, the reason for you to stay in Europe when it's uh, obviously the Australian summer is here now and uh, you know, the conditions will be a little bit harder to race and train in Europe uh, when it gets colder in winter. Um, what's your th- thought process there? Uh, it's, a mixture of a choice and not really a choice. Uh, I knew when I left Australia in July, it wasn't really going to be that easy to come back anytime this year. So uh, I really kind of had to make a pretty bold decision that I could be here for a long time or a short time. And now I'm kind of here for the long run. Uh, I have a French uh, residency permit, which allows me to stay in Europe longer than the three months, which I'm really lucky to have. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like I said, I really, I miss Australia. It's my home and the warm weather is something that I really love. But um, I think that we can still do the training here. And I'm currently in Croatia, uh, which is one of the warmer parts of Europe this time of year. 
um, and we're lucky that we still have really great access to facilities and if I can train and um, yeah I have the access that I need then that's enough for me uh, and my squad is also European based so that's a big um, a big call for me too to stay here. Fantastic and uh, yeah look it is it is one of those unique years isn't it where you have to make big decisions and and uh, you know live with the consequences whether it's good bad or indifferent and that brings me to you know how did as a as a, as a young girl growing up uh, you know you you're you're obviously a really talented swimmer is that is that something that you were spending most of your uh, early early days as an athlete doing uh, I mean ever since I was a baby I think I was in the water which I'm um, again really really grateful for um i grew up squad swimming uh so i was swimming between the age of 12 and the age of about 17 or 18 then nine or ten times a week so every morning before school i was in the water um and even saying that like i did grow up swimming but the past few years my swimming i wish was even better um the girls are so far so i'm grateful to have that background but i'm now still in the water for 20 to 25 kilometers a week trying to make that front group so yeah the they never finishes the the process to get better it's incredible isn't it the standard of swimming around the world is uh is phenomenal and in those events it is really crucial as compared to the endurance events it's it's so important to to be with the front pack isn't it uh yeah it's really people say you can't like you can't win the race from the swim but you can definitely lose and i think it's it's so true the past few years and um, we've seen that more and more and I think especially in the female racing um, there's always eight or ten females up the road now because that's just a little bit quicker um, than everyone else so that's really been my aim this year with my new coach to really be consistent and uh, I think I really I really shown that this year in my racing that my swimming has been consistent so um, that's a really great improvement for me leading into next year. And uh, you know swimming was a big part of your your uh, your youth uh, were you were you interested in running and riding or did that come later? Tell us about how, how you've developed into a triathlete. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as a swimmer, we actually did like two times a week. We just run 5K as fast as we could around the local swimming pool block, I suppose. Um, and I was probably like the one of three people that loved to just run and everyone else used to just walk. So... Um, <laughs> It's kind of funny because, I mean, swimmers don't really like to be on land, right? So, um, yeah, everyone, I actually um, kind of started winning cross country during my high school years and I won um, New South Wales State cross country uh, in 2008, um, which was a massive shock for me. I literally, like I said, I ran 10K a week just as fast as I could. Um, and then, yeah, I went to a few national sort of championships and, People kind of mentioned triathlon to me, but I never really knew about it. It wasn't very prominent in school for me. Um, I think it's a bit more prominent now. Um, and yeah, I competed in my first uh, triathlon uh, just for fun, I suppose, in 2008. Oh, 2009, sorry, at, um, at All Schools Championships uh, through the school system. Yep. And I swam really well, um, rode on an aluminium frame bike, and I think maybe I came eighth or something, but... Yeah, I, I loved it from that moment on, and um, yeah, it really, it really gave me the passion for the future. You pretty quickly found yourself on the world circuit if your first triathlon was in 2009. We were speaking off air about how uh, 2018 was such a good year for you. You came 11th um, on the ITU circuit, and you your best place was third uh, in one of the races in Abu Dhabi. So take us through some of your career highlights since being on the world circuit, uh, and even you know, including that 2018, and how that was a highlight for you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for starting my career, I made world championships, just my junior world championships three months after starting uh, the ITU sort of circuit as the junior, which was a bit of a shock. I uh, didn't think I was that good. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was really the start for me. Um, and then, yeah, definitely um, I've been in a few world championship mixed relays now, which is a really um, a magical opportunity to do because um, you only get that, there's only four people that can be chosen and um, if you do get chosen, you really have to grab the opportunity with both hands. Uh, 2018, I have to say, was uh, one of my best years. Um, yeah, with the podium Abu Dhabi, it's it's pretty special to be on a WTS podium, and especially in a race like that, I proved to myself I have good skills and um, I could really perform at a high level. 
Um, and yeah, and also that year we came second as a team, um, which was a great uh, opportunity leading into like the new Olympic cycle. So yeah, um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, but uh, yeah, it's really great to be starting to progress um, in the higher ranks um, as an elite. So you just, oh, you go, Jordan. Well, I was just going to ask on that. So 11th was the highest in 2018 and you want to obviously keep progressing on that. And then 2020 has been interrupted. Is your next goal to crack that top 10 and keep climbing up? Yeah, for sure. I think every WTS now I look at it that I really need to be at a top 10. Um, that's my level that I really want to hit and what I aim to be. So I think that was kind of my reasoning behind joining a new group. Um, my group is surrounded by girls that are really in that top level, the top 10, like consistently. So if I can train with them on a daily basis, um, that's like the aim where I want to be with them um, on race day as well as in training. So yeah, I, I hope in next year we can have a more consistent circuit um, and I can be, yeah, in that top 10. And the Olympics obviously were postponed this year and, um, and, hopefully they'll be they'll be in place next year but was that disappointing for you in your preparation um, and how have you handled having to defer that um, to to a whole new season is that something that's uh, been difficult yeah I mean we started 2020 um, with the processes of really um, focusing on the Olympics with heat prep even in 2019 it was all Olympic focus with planning and what we could do to be best prepared with those conditions, especially after seeing it at the Tokyo test event. Um, and then I suppose it all came crashing down really fast. It, within mm. March, I suppose, we raced the last race in Mooloolaba. Um, I'd just come home from Europe, actually, because Australia was the only racing that was happening at, at that time. Um, and then I think two weeks later, the Olympics was cancelled. So uh yeah for me i think this, this is the first chance that i've kind of thought oh i actually could go to the olympics so i have a good opportunity to do so so it, it is quite disappointing and but i really hope that um in the new year we have the olympics that will happen maybe it'll be a little bit different to what we're all planning my i think first time mm. to be like but um the opportunity to race the olympics is uh like i said like once in a lifetime so uh, yeah, this is just like refocusing, um, just having this year as a really steady sort of base. We haven't done that much hard work. It's just been consistent uh, 52 weeks of work now. Uh, so now we'll prep uh, as if the Olympics is going to happen um, and really go from there. I want to touch on that in a second because that I know you'll, you'll be very interested to hear how the you know, kind of base training has worked without racing. But can you just clarify for us uh, your goal for the Olympics? Are you aiming to qualify individually and uh, is there a team event in the Olympics or is it just one or the other? Uh, yeah, they will pick you regardless of um, the both events. So it would be a team that they think can race the individual well and also race uh, the mix really well. So, and if we only have the two spots, which what we only currently do for both male and females, um, we can have another athlete led just in case uh, someone gets sick or um, injured during the actual race. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's hard. We don't really know. And not, not to put pressure on you, but I think you are the number one ranked uh, female in Oceania at the moment. So is that, you know, do you feel that, that confidence or pressure for that the one, two, one of two spots? I mean, I think I've done everything I can. I've put myself in really opportunities over the past few years and shown that um, I can be a relay athlete and also a mixed relay uh, individual athlete, sorry. Uh, so yeah, this year, I think I really had to prove that my swim, uh, is consistent and I can swim without front girls because the first leg of the relay is so important, uh, to be in the mix because you really can be out of the mix straight away if you miss the front leg. So for me, I, yeah, I just really wanted to prove throughout the last couple of years that I can be the both types of athletes. So hopefully I've shown that to the selectors. And for those who don't know, can you explain the, how the mixed relay works? Because it's quite unique. It's a kind of a bit different in terms of its distances and it goes male, female, male, female. And, and the race itself is very different. It's really compact and really competitive for you know, positioning. Uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of hard to explain. We, yeah. we always tend to race a, a, a race before. So you're trying to recover as well as you can to race the next day just as well. Um, and I think personally that being a first female, you have a lot of pressure because the mm. race is kind of on, on you. Uh, and it's very different between the first and the third leg as a female because 
Uh, the third leg, sometimes you're playing catch up or third leg, you're just trying to stay in the race for, to help the last man. So yeah, it's a, a 300 meter swim normally, um, an 8K bike and a 1.6 kilometer run. Uh, so yeah, it's fast, it's furious. It's, it's 22, 23 minutes of, uh, of action. And I, I really, it's, it's so hard, but I really love being a part of it. Um, and now that technology is coming into play, I think the Olympics will show um, a variety of things from team tactics to the equipment that we can have um, to develop the mix relay to be a really good Olympic event. That's amazing. No, I really like that. I, th I think it's so exciting. And the, I just find the distance is so funny. You know, the 300 swim, the 1.6, it's obviously a mile, but um, it's just not what, something you see in terms of a sprint or an Olympic. Um, so run us through kind of the last, you know, this year of training, you mentioned that it's been a lot of base training. Obviously you went without a race for a long time and you chose to come to Europe to be able to race again and train with your squad. Uh, we want to know what kind of training you were doing over this period. Uh, you know, we had our, our athletes doing a lot of base training and just making sure that they were prepared for when races did come back up, they could step up to that. But, you know, what was your coach getting you to do and what was your squad really focused on? Yeah, I think as soon as we knew that racing wasn't going to happen, um, we really kind of shut it down on like the high intensity sort of work because there was no real point like physically and mentally trying to train for that when we didn't know what was happening in the next few months. So yeah, definitely um, swim wise, I was really, really lucky that I could go to the ocean and keep swimming. I know a lot of people couldn't. So um, yeah, we just kept ticking away the four or five kilometers a day, four times, five times a week, um, just to keep the arms, the arms sort of moving a little bit of, a little bit of speed, but nothing really like normal. Um, the run, I, I say I'm a tempo specialist now. I think I could run tempo like all day. We did so much this year um, of just steady, like just getting into a certain pace and just really getting into the flow of, of cadence work um, and even like uh, technique base work at that sort of pace because it's really easy to build off uh, a tempo and threshold sort of base uh, if it's there for racing. And the bike was quite similar. We just... Yeah, the eight to 10 minute is just kind of grinding it out, like just at a really solid sort of tempo pace again on short rest. Um, and the we kind of built into some harder efforts and we knew racing was coming with some short sprints just to build upon the base again. And I I actually do some uh, some gym work. So I do two like high, um, like I suppose lifting sort of sessions um, a week and then one plyometric session. So yeah, I really, um, I think gym was a really good thing for me this year with not racing because I actually had nearly 52 weeks of consistently being in the gym um, or the garage gym during COVID. So yeah, I was, uh, yeah, a really good base I think we've built this year. Um, I actually haven't been much with my squad because with COVID and the restrictions and COVID tests, uh, we kind of chose to be where it was most comfortable and where we had access to facilities. So that's why I spent most of my time in Hamburg, uh, not really with my squad uh, until recently because of just the way the world kind of operated this year uh, in Europe. That's really uh, fantastic that you've, you've been able to get that consistency into your program in your running and in your strength and conditioning. Do you, do you take much uh, emphasis into your, your diet and, and your nutrition? Um, is that a focus that you're really uh, um, keen on um, getting as part of your as your everyday routine is that something that's important uh it's i think it's the most important thing out of everything if you don't eat properly then it doesn't even transfer into your training um when i was probably 10 years ago as a junior um i was 10 kilos lighter than what i was now i was really really petite and i really didn't focus on um eating after training and kind of getting the level that i need uh post uh, post and pre sort of sessions. Uh, now it's, I work with someone that I've worked with for the past uh, 10 years and we've kind of focused on being like a robust sort of athlete. So if the post training is really the important part um, and I work with him a lot on uh, how I can fuel myself uh, for the next session, because that's when we're training so much in one day, it's really, really important to get, what you need in like straight away and then um, that will help you for the afternoon and even like the next day because I think a lot of people think you have an easy day and you can not eat very much but our bodies are still ticking away at such a high rate that 
it's so important to keep fueling um, at a significant sort of rate. And uh, I don't know if this helps, but we did a, um, a test this year and at rest, I burn 8,000 over 8,000 kilojoules at rest. So at such wow. a high amount, yeah. yeah, my metabolism is just ticking away. And we've got uh, results from years and years before. And just because I've kept eating and kept building my engine, uh, my metabolism has just taken that and just gone with it. So now that I say the more I eat, the more my metabolism just helps. And yeah, it's really helped me as an athlete. Wow, yeah. that's really, yeah, that's really, um, really good that you know that and that you've, you know, worked with someone to actually get that you know, part of your entire process correct. I mean, you, you've already said that you've got the strength and conditioning side. You obviously use um, a dietitian. Um, I want to ask about one part in a second, but with that post training food, what kind of things are you consuming? Yep. And is it, um, do you find that you and your squad eat similar things or is it more individualized to you? What kind of stuff do you actually have? Um, everyone's really individualized. I mean, I think some people are probably still learning that they need to eat before and after training. I think you can't, it's like a learning process. <laughs> like, unfortunately you learn it the hard way, but, um, yeah, I've kind of in Australia, I actually always have sausage. That's like my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> but I can't mm-hmm. get it overseas. Um, but chocolate milk, I always have that. Um, I either make some homemade, uh, homemade muesli bars, um, that like oat bars that I can uh, take to training or just even a banana. Um, I normally have two things uh, post post session, uh, just to get the calories in straight away. Um, yeah, pretty simple things you can buy. It's nothing special. It's just yeah, helping to get the calories and the protein and stuff in post workout. Even if it's easy or hard, you still need to have something. Making sure you're doing it is is probably the key, is what you're saying. Um, yeah, so, it's definitely a habit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, like I said, that's the strength and conditioning side, the dietitian side. And then I did read that you um, have employed previously a psychologist to help you with your goals and performance, especially you look at for the year ahead and, you know, what are you trying to achieve? So how important is it that is that mental side and that mindset side of um, your entire kind of approach that you've, you, you've got a lot of the other things nailed? Yeah, I think you have to stand on the start line feeling as well prepared as you can, both physically and mentally, because if you stand there knowing, oh, I'm going to do terribly today, then you've already lost the race before you even dove into the water. So we really worked on um, day four or week four of the race, uh, really knowing the course, uh, what we kind of wanted to achieve it ourselves. And they weren't like, um, how do I say, they were, they're all process outcomes. So everything from, we wrote down from swim, bike, run, and then like an overall sort of general concept of what we wanted to achieve. And uh, he really worked with us. Uh, to help plan that out and maybe change our mindset so it wasn't negative connotations. Uh, it always changed to positive, uh, which I kind of helped, uh, especially when you're in a bit of a struggle, you can kind of think back to what you've written down and um, re- it really helped you um, get going. What's an example of something you write down that's um, a positive connotation in terms of a process compared to a negative? Uh, I'd say like, like swimming, like, um, I don't want to have a slow stroke rate. You want to be like, uh, I want to have a high cadence and I want to be sprinting to the first, I want to have such and such to the first can. You don't want to be like, I don't want to do this. You want to always be on positive. Otherwise you think about the wrong thing before you think about the right thing. Definitely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, good. Yeah. So what do you think, what do you think is um, your biggest strengths in terms of your racing and, and, and your training? What, what kind of things do you think make you stand out as an athlete? Um, I think it sounds really cliche, but I like kind of, I love my job. It's like something that I really have a big focus on. And, um, my boyfriend knows that training's my first sort of focus. Uh, everything revolves around training. So I, if I, something needs to get done, it has to be done. Uh, I don't like missing things. So I think that's probably my main personal quality. Uh, I'm really just in the focus yeah in the focus what I really need to do um I suppose yeah you have to know like you have to stand on the start line knowing that you have done your best work and you've done everything possible so I think that's yeah that's kind of where it comes from I just want to be the best athlete I can and if I can stand on the start line knowing that I've done all the work I can then that's all I can do you seem like you've really uh gone into it in such great depth and um and and really focusing on key many setbacks or injuries along the way that, that have really, you know, 
really pushed you backwards and, and how have you handled that? Uh, in 2014, um, I had a hip arthroscopy. I had an eight millimeter tear uh, in my hip and I also had um, a bone. My bone was like kind of like con like a bump instead of like being concaved. So uh, I had to have surgery and they shaved down the bone off my femoral head and then had to repair the tear. Uh, so yeah, I actually had all of 2014 uh, mostly off racing. Um, it was quite hard for me when I first had surgery. I thought my career was done. I didn't think I would, I don't know, at the moment you're like, what's for me now? But in hindsight, I actually think it was probably one of the best years I could have had because I started doing gym work. I started focusing on the tiny little things like plyo and getting myself stronger and more robust. Um, and because I spent time away from the circuit, I could really focus on myself and things that I could, could improve um, without the distractions, everyone else being around me. So yeah, it, it was, it sucked. I mean, I didn't run for three months and back in the day, ultra G's weren't that common. So I had to, the Bulldogs football club actually let me use the ultra G at the time. So yeah, I was mm. quite lucky in that, in that sense. But um, yeah, that was touch wood. It's been the only injury that I've ever had uh, in my 10 years. So I've been really, really lucky. Um, but yeah, that was probably one of the hardest years. Uh, and then, yeah, it's just taken me a while now to, to build up that strength in my left hip. Um, when I first had the surgery, um, I told my leg to lift and it didn't lift because I lost muscle in it so fast, which you don't really think about. Um, and I was quite scared, but yeah, it's, it's been good so far. So um, yeah, that's all. And you could say it's luck, but you, you know, you've really said a couple of times on this episode that um, you really aim to be a robust athlete. And so it's not coincidence that if you put so much emphasis in diet and strength and conditioning and, and recovery that um, you will prevent injuries, although you know, not injuries are, are preventable. Um, but for a lot of our athletes, we really focus and emphasize on recovery, especially age group athletes as the older you get, the more recovery is important because you know, making sure you can get to the start line is pretty key. So what, what do you do to really focus on the recovery side of things and how much emphasis do you place on the recovery? Uh, quite a bit. Um, one of my old coaches used to say, why sit when you can stand, oh, why stand when you can sit, why sit when you can lie, when it's like, it's kind of a true concept because no one really likes standing around. So um, yeah, I've played a massive part. Um, being a professional, I'm pretty lucky with my daily sort of schedule. Um, I have the ability to, have the afternoon sometimes pretty relaxed before my last uh, session of the day. Um, nutrition, sleep, um, the gym um, is all really good parts of being injury free um, and it really the bone density side of things too, especially for female athletes. Um, that's a major part of why we do the gym work and plyometrics. Uh, yeah, I think as a junior, you think you're a bit invincible. So I don't think I played as much importance as that when I was a bit younger, but now that I'm getting older, um, as soon as I come home from training, I'm like, okay, I need my time to myself. And that's the time that I choose to choose to lay down and to recover. So yeah, I think over time, you just have to have to learn that um, what's, you have to do what's best for you to be the best athlete you can. You find that uh, the recovery is so important, but is there something that you think you could do to take your mind away just to, to get it off the focus of, because you're very dedicated from what we've heard in this podcast about how you go about it. Is there something that can relax you um, or is there something you think like a lot of people like to do some study or they like to have a part-time hobby or is there something that, that you do outside that gives you that recovery rest from physical and mental training? Um, I'm pretty lucky my boyfriend's not in triathlon, so it's really nice to come home to him and not have to talk about things that I've done in my day. We can talk about other things. Um, I generally enjoy baking. Um, that's something that I, I really like. And I suppose um, during COVID, I like to do some projects. So I actually built my own um, squat rack and chin-up bar in my backyard. So <laughs> that was like just like something like that I enjoy doing just because it was it was fun and um, a bit of an adventure um, and something that I normally didn't get time to do. So um, yeah, I mean, the normal things like watching a movie, reading a book, uh, that sort of things. But also when we come to new places and we have easy days, um, I like to see a bit of the sights around the new towns that we're in because 
you don't get many opportunities to do that. So yeah, I try and make the most out of the, the travel that I get to have. Now, something I wanted to ask kind of on a similar note was, I mean, from an outside point of view, the pro circuit looks so intense. The amount of races that happen, uh, I, I assume that you break it into kind of a base season. And then once it's race season, are you really just trying to recover between races, especially if you're backing out week after week or do you find because they're sprints, you can um, recover quite quickly. I mean, how do you actually manage the, the race load? Yeah, um, early season is a bit easier because we have about three or four weeks between the racing. But in the June to July, when it's back to back or even like the individual in the relay and then we're racing again the next weekend. Uh, yeah, it's, it is really important uh, for recovery and not actually doing too much in between because it's, uh, you don't really need to. You don't lose fitness between a week and a week. Uh, so it's really just tra either traveling to the next place, um, getting settled and getting back into a routine. Um, but also there's kind of the other fine line of not doing too many races because that's when you actually start losing fitness because you're not training uh, in between. So I think the most that we would do is either like probably like the two, two, two to three races maybe. Um, but apart from that, we'd never keep racing like weekend and weekend. And um, we race the French Grand Prix and also the German Bundesliga. Um, and a lot of those times um, the races aren't so important. We just train through those races because um, mm. we had the opportunity to do so um, and wait for a major race to taper back down. Fantastic. Um, so the big year for Tokyo, have you got a plan that you work backwards from and assuming that you'd be selected? That would be obviously, um, you know, in the forefront of your mind. Do you work your training program back from that date and everything's geared towards that or, or is it not the most important thing for the season? How, how do you uh, manage what's, what's the key goals here? And the Olympics are massive in, in, in the world. And yeah, I'm just interested in your thoughts on, what the process is for you? Uh, yeah, I suppose I'm currently in week two of the new 2021 season leading to the Olympics. Uh, yeah, we definitely do uh, blocks of training. Um, we know what's ahead of us. Uh, and I suppose, I don't know if I'm selected yet, but we have to plan as if I was. Um, so this month is just the base sort of training. And then from January onwards, we start introducing the, the heat work um, and the high intensity sort of training that we'll need leading into the new sort of seasons. Uh, yeah, the Olympics obviously are the pinnacle and I, I think most of my squad is looking towards that. So it's kind of great because everyone's on the same sort of, same sort of pathway. But um, yeah, if I don't qualify for the Olympics, I know that there's still a WTS season that I can race and, and achieve good results. So, yeah, I think at the moment we plan as if the Olympics are happening and I do, I do go. But um, for us, especially with the selection period being so late now, um, with the new discretion whole process and we don't really know when the Olympic qualifying points are starting again, um, it's quite hard. So I think we have to kind of race both, be fit for both. I need to be fit for the WTS season to get chosen, maybe, and then get fit for the Olympics. So. Um, yeah, next year's a bit a bit different, I think, to normal years. That's, that's great, though, that you've got that plan kind of really well set and um, mentally, you, you know, you're really focused on exactly what you want. I guess that has to be key if you're going to you know, commit to the goal. You have to really know what's ahead. We've actually spoken to some pro athletes on the podcast um, and one who was also uh, looking for the Olympics in the athletics had kind of an opposite approach where he said that, he actually doesn't want to know what's ahead. He just wants his coach to tell him kind of week by week as it's coming. Uh, he doesn't like to kind of handle that mm. pressure. So it's interesting hearing the different approaches uh, for you, knowing that you know, that is the big goal. That's the pinnacle. That is the A race, um, you know, to, to apply a similar kind of mentality to what our athletes go through when they choose their A race. How do you go with that last month kind of leading into it, that taper phase physically and mentally? You know, how do you approach that process? I think I've kind of learnt throughout the years seeing other athletes go to the Olympics and being at many world championships that you kind of have to do your own thing. Um, everyone tends to get a bit like a bit antsy, I suppose. And it's just the way that everyone deals with coming into a big event. There's a lot of pressure and being in international, I've seen the pressure from different countries. So I think I've learnt from seeing other people when I was younger that I kind of have to be relaxed and just take the time for myself because I think that's the best sort of way to prepare. 
Um, yeah, even with tapering and stuff, uh, every athlete is so different to what they need leading into a race and in race week. So yeah, I think even with like with my, I was with my old coach for nine years and we kind of learned a process what works for me. Um, and now with my new coach this year has been a great opportunity to kind of learn what we need leading into next year, kind of like a test run, I suppose. Um, which is kind of the same with the Olympic sort of base sort of work. We kind of did a test run earlier in the year. Now we kind of know what we need. Um, so, yeah, I think just take it. You have to do what's best for you. As selfish as that sounds, it's like you just have to do it. Have you found, uh, obviously, changing coaches would have been difficult. You've been with someone for so long and you had known each other very intimately with what works how has it been with the new coach? Has, have, you, have you straight away found uh, immediate differences or, or is there just subtle changes that have, uh, that have enabled you to, to feel like you're improving? And that's the key, isn't it? Every day you want to feel like you're just getting better than you were the day before. Yeah, it's really true. Um, I think with my new coach, I've had a lot better communication. Um, I've been able to talk to him and we've kind of worked through what I need. And we both, when I kind of met with him to start with him, um, we kind of sat down and said, well, what are you looking for out of this? And I basically said, I, I want to swim consistently. That was my biggest thing. And I want to be more uh, consistent as a whole um, athlete and be at that top sort of level. Um, but being in a group environment for so long, it was quite easy to go into another group environment. I already knew how the structure should have, should have worked and how everyone operates in a group. So I think it was quite an easy transition to move uh, into his group. Um, although I haven't had much time, it hasn't been the easiest year to join a new squad. Um, but mm. I really enjoyed the training that we've had. And um, he was a really great communicator throughout this period. Um, and he really, I think everyone, like I said, everyone has different personalities. So he was kind of like, if you need time to step back, from triathlon this year and just keep doing base work that's fine I'm I'm happy to you to do that because if that's what you need to get through this year then that's what you need to do so yeah I think he was he was really good in that sort of aspect to get us through this COVID year that's awesome Natalie well um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up there I mean your professionalism has been really impressive um, again we've spoken to a lot of um, different varying athletes of different um different versions of the sport, I guess you'd say, because the sport ranges from, you know, what you're doing to right up to half Ironman, Ironman and hearing everyone's differences is, is always interesting, but yeah, your, your professionalism is really impressive how well-rounded you are and uh, your approach to everything. So we'll definitely be rooting for you through Tokyo and all our listeners will be, I'm sure, uh, especially, you know, hearing your story in detail, they'll be really excited to now know you and, and watch you at Tokyo. So good luck with it all. Hopefully this election all goes well and you keep, uh, going with your form and uh, can perform really well at Tokyo. We'll be looking forward to watching it. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Natalie. Really appreciate it. Fantastic.